All right, in the spirit of time, we're condensing the sermon, the scripture reading. It's all going to just be jumbled into one here today to keep us moving here. But uh, today, if you couldn't notice, it's been a busy day. We've done Juneteenth, we've uh, Father's Day, we've uh, honored the Native Americans with the uh, arbor uh, erection or the uh, uh, erected arbor that we have out there. We have all kinds of great things going on, and we have Pride Month that we are still going through. We've been doing a preaching series through this uh, Pride Month. We have Sodom and Gomorrah that we talked about two weeks ago. Uh, the theme of welcoming strangers, and we looked at how the story has nothing to do with the hurtful ways people often misuse that story. Last week, we talked about the possible relationship between David and Jonathan, and we briefly glanced at some other biblical characters that the LGBTQ community may identify with in very affirming ways. This week, we're going to be moving into the New Testament. Specifically, we're looking at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 is a place in the New Testament that is most often used to condemn the LGBTQ community. Now, since today is an abbreviated service, or at least attempting to make it an abbreviated service, we're bringing it uh, uh, to a close for the Arbor Project. We're going to go quickly with an aerial shot of this chapter, which is kind of unfortunate because there's so much to be said, and it's complex in unpacking this particular uh, scripture reading this morning, but I'm going to give you hopefully some nuggets of information. Hopefully what we can accomplish is that with the nuggets of information that I'm able to give to you, maybe hopefully you can process what I'm trying to say, and it'll give you some context and information to then maybe go home and do your own study, to, to look into it and, and use this as just a foundation for deeper study, because there is so much more to be said than what we'll hit today. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put it in context. First thing we're going to say is oftentimes when we read the Bible, people read the Bible and they get hung up on viewing the Bible as the Word of God or it's Holy Scripture. And it's a great, not that that's a bad thing, but sometimes that puts extra baggage on the Scripture that was never intended to be there in the first place. When Paul was writing his letter to the Romans, guess what? It was a letter to the Romans. That's it. What we know is the Bible didn't even come around for another 300 years or so, give or take a few decades there, depending on who's doing the math. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were not written. In fact, Paul's the first one to be writing these things that we now call biblical scripture. So there really wasn't anything conceived at this point. It was Paul. And he was simply writing a letter. So we need to kind of step back a little bit, dial it down a little bit, and read this as a letter. What was Paul trying to say to the Romans? Well, let's open up the letter and read what it was saying. So you open up Romans chapter 1, and it starts off with the typical way to start off a letter. Paul's like, so, how you doing? You know, uh, hope to see you soon. You know, you guys are great. I love you. And then he gets into it. Romans chapter 1, verse 18 is where he really begins getting into it, is verse 18. Now, I know the Bible can be hard to understand, and especially this complex verse can be a little hard to understand. So I'm going to clue you in on what to listen for. Paul is arguing against the old pagan ways of worship in the early church. So read it through these ears. They may have included Jesus in their worship style. We're Christians. We're going to worship Jesus now. But they're worshiping Jesus in their old, old pagan style of worship. So listen as we read Romans 1, 18, actually going all the way to 27 for this. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against us, uh, against all ungodliness and wickedness of those who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood and seen through things he has made. So they are without excuse, for, they, for though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory for the immortal God for images resembling mortal human beings, or birds, or four-footed animals, or reptiles. 
Therefore, God gave them up to lust in their hearts, to impurity, to the degrading of their bodies amongst themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the cre uh, creature rather than creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to degrading passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural. And in the same way, the men giving up natural intercourse with women were consumed with passion for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received their own personal, um, their own persons, the due penalty for their error. All right. There's a lot said. There's a lot going on. But what's Paul talking about? Paul is talking about in his verse, worshiping images of humans. That we're supposed to be worshiping the immortal God, but we're worshiping images of humans. He's also talking about worshiping images of birds and other animals. They're using these pagan icons as part of our worship. But then all of a sudden, he, he's also talking about degrading their bodies and describing different parts of a sexual encounter. So what, what's going on here? Why in one breath is he talking about, you know, this style of worship that we shouldn't be, you know, worshiping these creatures, these images, and then all of a sudden goes into this talk about sexuality or, 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 or degrading of our bodies. Well, in the ancient world, pagan worship was often intertwined with sex. We've heard about the Greek and Roman orgies. Well... That wasn't just a, a fun night out at the local swingers club. <laughs> that was worship. They were experiencing God in that act. Through the euphoric climax, they reached the divine in union with the divine. So when Paul found out that these early Christians were worshiping Jesus by having an orgy, he felt the need to write them a letter. He said, okay, folks, you're doing it wrong. We, we have to change your style of worship. This isn't how we worship Jesus. Now, you think I'm making some changes in the worship service. Paul had to make some pretty difficult changes. <laughs> you know, in the Romans are like, but this is how we always did it. You know, let's just keep doing it the same way. But before we're too quick to judge the Romans for their style of worship, worshiping images of animals and having these orgies during the worship service. Let's take a look at the Jewish religion for a second. But you didn't think I was going to go there, did you? <laughs> when we go back to the book of Exodus, Moses goes up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. Remember the scene? He's taking too long. Everyone's becoming impatient. So while he's up in the mountain, they melt down the gold and they make images of a golden calf. And according to the Bible, this is exactly what happened when they were worshiping the animals. Exodus 32, 6. Early the next day, the people sacrificed burnt offerings and brought fellowship offerings afterwards. They sat down for a feast, which turned into an orgy. Just good old-fashioned Jewish worship service. <laughs> This is an ancient style of worship across various cultures. This is what happened when you were worshiping God in many pagan styles, pagan ways of worship. I don't know if it was every worship service, you know, but you know, this is this is part of part of how it happened. So we might want to point fingers at the Romans for, oh my gosh, I can't believe that they were worshiping in that way. The Hebrews were doing the very same thing. Because that's the style of worship. Now, Romans chapter 1 was not addressing two men who fell in love. It's not there. Romans chapter 1 is not addressing two women who fell in love. It's not there. Paul was addressing the worship style in which they were worshiping Jesus through these old pagan customs. For the sake of time, we're going to jump down quickly, so these leaps that you have to fill in with your own study at home. We're going to jump down to the end of chapter 1. Paul gets into one of his angry fits here, and Paul's known for his anger management issues. So starting with verse 28, Paul says this, 
Since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to debase mind and to things that should not be done. They were filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, conviciousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceitfulness, craftiness. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, rebellious towards their parents, foolish, faithless, hurtless, ruthless. They know God's degrees that those who practice such things deserve to die, yet uh, they not only do them, but they applaud others who practice them. Told you he had anger management issues. Now, the whole they deserve to die, I'm not sure how literal he was because, you know, if the, had gossips in here? If gossips were supposed to be put to death, there would be no church, right? I mean, we can agree on that, right? <laughs> so there, there's a whole bunch of stuff he's just ranting about. Here's where it gets interesting with this particular rant. This rant appears at the very end of chapter 1. This is how chapter 1 closes, basically. But when Paul was writing his letter to the Romans, there was no such thing as chapters and verses in Scripture. All the chapters and verses we know about in the Bible were added to the Bible hundreds and hundreds of years later, so we could find their place. When Paul is writing a letter, he's not going, and to the Romans, verse 2, I'm happy to see you, verse 3, you know, he, it's not how he's doing it. He's writing a letter. So it's one stream of consciousness. So chapter 1 flows into chapter 2. There's no separation. There's no arbitrary divider. And believe me, there is power in the arbitrary dividers of the chapters and verses, things we'll talk about in other sermons over the years. You can manipulate the reader simply by where you choose to break a chapter or not choose to break the chapter. When we're reading chapter 1, we're going, oh, I'm going to read Romans chapter 1. So you read chapter 1 and you stop. And you assume chapter 2 is going to be like another part. So they're separated when they were intended to be together as one thought. Now chapter 2 begins with the ther word therefore. Okay? One of my worst subjects in school, by the way, was English. But the one thing I do know is therefore, he's about to make a point, right? But you cannot start a new thought with therefore. I can't come up here to preach a sermon and have the first word of my sermon going, therefore, you know, and you're like, therefore what? You know, there's no context. So he starts with therefore. Now, different English translations, different Bibles might have slightly different words. A lot of the words use therefore, but that's, that's what's going on there. He's making his point with the word therefore. So we need to start asking ourselves, what's the therefore? They connect to each other. We've got to erase the two in chapter 2 and just read it as one flow of thought. So this is what's going on. He just ranted on with that list of all kinds of horrible things, including gossips. And then he says this, Romans 2, verse 1. Therefore you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on others, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, are doing the very same thing. That's his conclusion. I want to do that again to make sure we get it. And we're going to end this sermon soon so we can get on to other fun stuff. But with that, we'll close with this Romans 2, 1. He's driving to a point, and then his point, therefore, we're getting to his point, you have no excuse, whoever you are, when you judge others. For in passing judgment on others, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, are doing the very same thing. So for the sake of time, again, we're going to wrap things up, but we're going to just recap where we are. Again, I gave you a bunch of scattered bullet points on this chapter that you need to research yourself because there's so many gaps that I didn't fill in here today. But what we do know is that when Paul was writing this letter, he was writing a letter addressing the pagan style of worship. He starts off saying, this is my problem, your pagan style of worship. Throughout this chapter, we never see Paul condemning two people who fall in love. And the irony, when you research this on your own, focus on the irony. 
that Romans chapter 1 is one of the New Testament verses most often used to judge people. Do you see where we're going with this? Romans chapter 1 is one of the chapters in the New Testament most used to judge people. Yet the conclusion Paul seems to be driving to, ironically, is that we are simply not to judge others. And I think that's a good part for an amen. amen. And with that, our benediction is going to be our dedication. So will the powers that be come up for our dedication and we'll transition. Should I give one to David? I don't know. As we, Walter. It's on. It's on. Okay. As we gather our hearts and minds together, we give our gratitude and deep appreciation to the sacred direction of the East. As an eagle soars into the morning light, our hearts open to new ideas, new experiences, and new friendships that the Tamuqua Honor Arbor brings to our lives. South, as we gather our hearts and minds together, we give gratitude and deep appreciation to the sacred direction of South. We are ready to learn new ways to communicate the truth of love and to walk with a deeper sense of trust. As we gather our hearts and minds together, we give our gratitude and deep appreciation to the sacred direction of the West. As we take the light of the day within, we move into our inner beat knowing Gratitude for completion of our goals. We remember our ancestors. We honor the body of Mother Earth and all who live in the circle of life on our planet. North, as we gather our hearts and minds together, we give our gratitude and deep appreciation to the sacred direction of North. We find rest and peace and we purify our thoughts receiving healing and open our minds into the knowing all is one, all is one. Winsong, 
for its support of me and uh, our special emphasis. As the article said in the newspaper, I've been uh, captivated by Native American culture and spirituality all my life. And you in Winsong and this church has made it blossom to a way that I've never expected and I've never been privileged to have before. So thank you. I want to also thank Katerina. You know, it's interesting. I want to tell the story of the picture that's on our bulletin, the picture that she drew, put together. I had this idea of, of the arbor and obviously the spirit gave her a picture, an image of, an alt, of the arbor as well. I sent several emails saying, no, the arbor is in front of the tree, not around the tree. But every one that she sent back, it was still around the tree. And I'm so glad that that prevailed, that she was led by the spirit to keep it around the tree. Because as you hear shortly in the Tamuka creation story, this tree is central to their culture. Not this particular tree, but trees in general. So I thank you, Katerina. Also uh, want to mention for those of you who are still interested in donating to uh, the arbor, it's basically covered, but Winsong has other visions that are, have been emerging and coming to us. And of course, one of them is the blanket exercise ceremony. And that's going to cost us some money to, to develop. And not a whole lot, but at least some. We already have an invitation to go to Sarasota to do that in November. So we will be working on that. So there are ways, I don't know, Deb, did you, where is Debbie? Debbie, uh, is there a box back there someplace? Okay. Okay. Okay, there's a box back there for wind song projects or wind song missions. We're inside instead, rather than going outside for a number of reasons. One, we came here with my scooter so I could actually go out there and we couldn't get the scooter open. So <laughs> uh, I can't walk out to the arbor. I can only go out on the scooter. So we're staying inside plus the threat of, of rain. And I want to say this about the rain is as that hymn we sang gave credit to the waters as, as uh, a creator uh, introduced. We are, a lot of us, water, some more than others. Uh, actually, they, they say about 60% of us are water. So this rain is coming, is actually somebody coming. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's, it's particular parts of our, of our body, like our heart and our brain, or even more than 60%, they're like 70 some percent water. So I share that with you. Uh, and again, we wouldn't be at this point if it wasn't for Todd Bednarik and his design and his work, the amount of time that he's invested, we still have things to get done, so please, please, Help us uh, planting the the, shrub, the flowers, the climbers, and some other thing, other things that still need to be done. So we do need your help. Okay, I'm going to share with you now the story of the wind song, or not the wind song, but the Tamuka creation story.
Today we would have gathered in front of that great oak tree, but we're here, and nonetheless we honor the Tamuka First Nation people who once lived here but are gone. They were once the largest indigenous tribe in Florida, perhaps over 200,000. Their land covered approximately 17,000 square miles. We honor and lament that they are gone, but they have left us a sacred story of the creator and the sacred tree. They would ask the tree for permission, explain their need, and ask for forgiveness before they would cut one down. They believed that to cast one down before its natural time was to disrespect it and to bring about our own destruction. So hear this story. When Creator, they called Yajaba, created the world, he first created the spirit of water and the spirit of wind. Creator then created a large pond and in the middle of the pond, he placed land. He then put swimmers in the pond, some who breathed on top of the water and others under the water. Creator saw that the land started to slide into the waters. So he urged the swimmers to hold the land securely, but they could not prevent the land from sliding into the water. So Creator opened the great cave and brought out of that cave the two-legged, the four-legged, the winged ones, the crawlers, and the aurorari, or we call insects. They all found a place for their home. As wind and water moved across, as wind and water moved about, the Creator saw more land sliding into the waters. All those that were on in the waters and those that came out of the great cave could not hold the land from sliding. So Yajaba created the one-legged ones. He saw to them, he said to them, you are my silent ones. You have no voice and you have but one leg, so you cannot move. But you are, a one, you are wondrous because you are the protectors of the land. Where I place you, you are to grab the land and hold it still so that when the wind blows and the waters flow, it is you who will hold tightly to the land. All of you from the mightiest oak to the smallest flower, to the single blade of grass, you are my land protectors. You will be given special gifts for being steady. Others will be amazed how you can live almost anywhere, in the crevices of rocks, on the face of mountains, in burning sand, in fresh or salt water, in arid land or fertile land. Some of you will have sting, stinging needles. Others will have leaves that change their color. Some of you will provide food for many. Some of you will offer shade. Uh, some will offer homes in your arms for others. Some of you will live but a, a single cycle. Others of you some of you who live have a single cycle, but you will have many children, while others who will have many cycles will be known as the ancient ones. When you fall to the ground, you will become part of the land, and your children will take hold of where you once stood and draw strength from you. All those who came out of the cave must show you great respect for they will know you are the true protectors of the land. If they fail, 
they will suffer greatly. You are my one-legged ones. You have no voice, but you are the protectors of the land. On your bulletin for the today, the insert, there is a statement of conscience on the back side of it. I would like you to join together with me in this statement. We respectfully acknowledge that the property of this congregation stands on the ancestral land of the First Nation people of Florida, specifically the Tamuka. Following the invasion of European settlers, their lives were permanently changed, their land confiscated, and their culture essentially lost. We pay honor to these First Nation people as we open ourselves to learn more about their sacred paths of others and commit ourselves to a more equitable, sacred space for life. Leslie Esteridge, our conference associate minister, would you lead us in the of dedication? The Florida Conference in covenant with you all. Very glad to be here, thank you. As a special place for celebration, where accomplishments are recognized, where music and rhythm is released, dance and body can move freely, where all of nature is welcome. We so dedicate. As a welcoming place for learning, where all ages come excited to grow, to open heart and mind, to meet unfamiliar people, ideas, and experiences, to expand ourselves and our wisdom. So dedicate. As a safe place for healing, where bro broken ways can be mended, hope restored, and peace that passes all understanding can be embraced. We so dedicate. As part of the benediction, I want to read a passage from the Gospel of Matthew in the First Nation people version of that Gospel. Come close to my side, you whose hearts are on the ground, you who are pushed down and worn out, and I will refresh you. Follow my teachings and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest from your troubled thoughts. Walk side by side with me, and I will share in your heavy load and make it lighter. Wakantanka Kikiun Wawawa. May the Creator bless you with peace.